So um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome everybody here tonight to um, the latest lecture in uh, the Centre for Economic Performance's 21st anniversary series. My name's John Van Rienen. I'm the director of the Centre for Economic Performance. And um, we're very happy tonight to have Professor Barry Eichengreen from the uh, University of, of uh, Berkeley okay, in California. Um, it's a particularly good chance for uh, Barry to speak tonight since uh, he has just published an excellent book, which I can recommend you uh, buy. I think there's copies outside. And Barry's actually said he'll be prepared to st uh, stay behind afterwards to do some signings of the book. So I'd encourage you to, to do that. Uh, Barry doesn't really need much introduction from me. He's, uh, I'm sure, very well known to all of you. Uh, I'll just say a few words. Um, Barry uh, got his um, PhD from Yale University for before moving on to Harvard as an assistant professor. He then moved to, um, to the University of California at Berkeley in 1986, where he's essentially stayed uh, with occasional jaunts to do other things, like advising, being the senior policy advisor to the International Monetary Fund. Um, Barry is obviously a leading uh, uh, academic across many fields of uh, international macro, economic history, uh, globalization, and labor and the subject of tonight's uh, talk on uh, international monetary systems. Uh, but he's also, in addition to that, uh, actively engaged in policy debates, being a very frequent writer and speaker in the media uh, and in the, in, in the global blogosphere, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's extraordinarily important. And one of the things that's very admirable about people like Barry is that they're prepared to do top-class economic research but also try and get that out in the real world to, to uh, interact with people who are policy makers and members of the public. So without further ado, I introduce you to uh, Barry and uh, the subject of exorbitant privilege, the rise and the fall of the dollar. So thank you, John, for the, um, the overkind uh, introduction. I'm happy to, uh, to be here to help celebrate um, CEP's 21st first, uh, birthday. It's also nice to be uh, back in, in, in this building and uh, at this institution. I am reminded that while I was finishing my uh, dissertation, I, I spent some time at the, uh, the public record office uh, working away in the archives on the uh, devaluation of sterling in 1931, and among the things I, I, I did during that stay was I came over to uh, the LSE to talk to uh, Professor Lionel Robbins, um, who was very much here about his uh, um, views of that uh, devaluation and his dispute with Keynes in the early 1930s about what appropriate international monetary policy should be, uh, and, and for me that was uh, a, a memorable uh, coffee and, and discussion we had together, partly because he was a, a charming and, and somewhat self-effacing man who said uh, something that I've never heard from an economist uh, since, which was, I may have been wrong about that. <laughs> um, so if, if I'm around after a, 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 a suitably long period of time, you can come back and, and ask me if, uh, um, why I, I was wrong about uh, uh, any of what is about to, uh, to follow. Um, what I uh, do in a way is, uh, as, as John kind of hinted, is, is to try to use uh, economic history not only to, to understand the past, although that is fundamentally what uh, economic historians do, but uh, as a frame to uh, try to think about the future uh, as well. So this book uh, is, is once again uh, one of my familiar efforts to do that, but it is uh, at the same time a little bit different than what I've written in the past in, in, in that it's an attempt to speak to a, a broader audience. So as part of that effort, I have the, uh, the pleasure, it is a pleasure, to speak to informed uh, audiences at institutions in halls like this one, but also to do uh, things like morning radio in the United States, where the quality of the discourse, the kind of questions you're asked, and the uh, kind of uh, call-in uh, commentary uh, that you get is, is um, 
I could put it politely, highly variable. What I, what I detect uh, from that commentary, though, is a remarkably high level of anxiety in the United States about the prospects for and the, and, and the future of the dollar. So you will have noticed that uh, uh, many American politicians uh, and journalists, and I'm here to report this is true of the general public as well, are quite concerned about inflation in the U.S., uh, despite the fact that there is not a hint of uh, in, in inflation yet in the data that core inflation in the U.S. in February year over year was running at 1.1 percent uh, below the Fed's target. But there are very serious problems about what might uh, be coming. In particular, there is the, uh, the problem that Peter Orzag will talk about in this forum uh, in, in, in some weeks of a, uh, a chronic U.S. budget deficit and a dysfunctional political system that shows no signs uh, of being able to bring that uh, under control. So people are, are worried, and, and here I would say with uh, some grounds uh, about uh, the future of the dollar, they're worried that the Fed, which has already come under growing political pressure for a variety of reasons, will similarly come under, under, under pressure to help with this fiscal burden as it grows, and whether consciously or inadvertently it will be reluctant to raise interest rates and compound the difficulties uh, of servicing the debt at the appropriate time. And uh, um, uh, things could get quite out of hand. So there are a number of um, uh, indications, I, I think, of the extent of an anxiety, the nature of the public discourse, the level of gold prices which is another indication that there is um, less than uh, full confidence uh, in, the, in the dollar. Um, the bright side, if you will, is that for there to be flight uh, away from the dollar, uh, there have to be places to flee. And the, uh, the alternatives, the, uh, the, uh, the potential rivals like the euro have serious problems uh, of their own. And in addition, the dollar uh, is unique. It, it has the singular advantage. It has the exorbitant privilege, to quote uh, the then French finance minister, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, that it's not only America's currency, but the, but the world's. So that is where the title comes from, and that is uh, on, on what the book focuses, the truly extraordinary extent to which the uh, dollar remains the dominant vehicle for um, international transactions worldwide. The Bank for International Settlements does a, a, a survey of foreign exchange uh, markets every three years. It released the most recent of those surveys about a month ago, which showed that the dollar is still used in fully 85 percent of uh, foreign exchange transactions globally. Uh, I spend some of my time uh, working on Asia and, and visiting South Korea. Uh, in particular, um, I've discovered that the, uh, the featured wine at all academic conferences in South Korea is Montes Alpha, imported from Chile because there's a free trade agreement between uh, Chile and, and, and South Korea. When a South Korean wholesaler wants to import Montes Alpha, uh, he trades won for dollars, and he uses those dollars in order to uh, import the, you know, complete the transaction with the uh, Chilean supplier. The data show that 99% of all foreign exchange transactions involving Korean won are trades of won for dollars. The data show that 99% of all foreign exchange transactions involving Chilean pesos are trades uh, of pesos for dollars. So all of these uh, are, are reminders that although we live in an increasingly multipolar uh, world, where the U.S. is only 20 percent of the world economy, the dollar is still remarkably uh, uh, dominant uh, globally. Uh, the latest data we have on the foreign exchange reserves of central banks and, and governments around the world shows that 61 percent of all uh, foreign exchange reserves 
uh, are still held in dollars. I have some other ex examples in the book. When Somali pirates ransom a ship, they demand that the ransom money be parachuted to them in dollars. When uh, Iran gives President Karzai's people bags full of money, the money in question is presumably uh, in dollars. I uh, suggest in the book, and I, I would be prepared to argue further, that uh, uh, this fact is not an entirely unmixed blessing for the United States. It is a considerable convenience for U.S. firms to be able to do, do international business in their own currency and not to worry about currency conversion costs and exchange risk if the exchange rate moves against them. It's similarly a competitive advantage for, uh, for U.S. banks. And this exorbitant privilege that everybody wants our dollars is one factor that has allowed uh, the United States as a country and U.S. households to live beyond their means for as long uh, as we, we have. We've been able to run larger current account deficits uh, than would have been possible in the absence of this voracious appetite for dollars uh, abroad um, because f foreigners want our dollars to finance their uh, international transactions. Uh, they want to uh, accumulate dollars as uh, insurance against uh, unforeseen uh, financial shocks. So they're willing to lend to us uh, in order to acquire them. But the other side of this coin, if you will, is that if we in the United States are prone to financial excesses, if, for example, we engage in frenzied real estate speculation, then those foreign investors give us more rope. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to argue that the dollar's exorbitant uh, privilege and the fact that there was this appetite for dollars on the part of the People's Bank uh, of China, among others, is the uh, only factor that made for the financial crisis, for the subprime crisis that uh, we have just been through. I hope I'm justified in using the, uh, the past tense. But I would argue that uh, this was an important uh, confounding factor that we wouldn't have had this kind of real estate bubble, this kind of mania, and then bust uh, if foreigners had not been willing to lend to us for as long at uh, as low interest rates uh, as was in fact the case. So when we're in the United States willing to hang ourselves, the rest of the world gives us, gives us more rope as a result of the uh, the dollar's uh, ex exorbitant privilege. What I'd like to do is uh, step back for a minute and talk about how we got into this peculiar uh, situation where the U.S. is only a sliver, uh, a 20 percent sliver of the world economy, yet the dollar is still uh, essentially the only global currency. I want to look back a little bit at the history in, in order to try to understand better uh, what might uh, Come, come next. The his, history, as uh, always is the case when you look at it closely, is a bit more complicated than the textbooks tell you. The dollar uh, gained its uh, uh, international preeminence. The dollar became a leading international currency really in two steps. Uh, a first step af during and after World War I, when the dollar was uh, first internationalized, the, uh, the process that China is now uh, initiating with respect to its own currency. Uh, and then a second step after World War, uh, during and after World War II, when the dollar went from a position really uh, of co-equality with the pound sterling as one of two consequential uh, international currencies to the far and away the dominant international currency uh, after 1945. Why uh, it became so dominant after 1945 is no mystery. You know, the U.S. Uh, was the only economy standing. We were far and away the leading exporter. We were far and away the leading foreign investor. Um, only the United States had deep and liquid financial markets open to the rest of the world. So it made eminent sense for uh, firms and banks and governments and central banks when they did international transactions uh, to do them. Uh, in dollars. The U.S. was so dominant and there weren't obvious uh, alternatives. That uh, uh, U.S.-centric uh, Western world is no longer 
uh, with us, as you know. There was the post-war uh, reconstruction and, and, and growth uh, uh, of Western Europe, the post-war reconstruction and economic miracle in Japan, the emergence uh, of emerging markets. So the U.S. is much less dominant economically than it was half a century ago, but uh, the dollar is still uh, um, as um, dominant uh, uh, as it um, once was. So why has the dollar held on to its uh, preeminent uh, position? The uh, commonplace answer is the advantages of incumbency. So it, it, under normal circumstances, it's an advantage for uh, a, a politician uh, to be the incumbent in a contested election. It's similarly adv advantageous for a national currency to be the incumbent global currency. If everybody else is using your currency in their international transactions, it's the incumbent global currency. It similarly makes sense for other people to do the same. Everybody else is, is pricing and quoting their exports in dollars. You want to break into international markets. You want to make it easy for customers to compare the, uh, the price of what you're selling with the price of what other people are selling with everybody else quoting prices or um, uh, quoting prices financing their trade in, in, in dollars. It similarly makes uh, sense for you uh, to do the same. The economists in, in, in the room will know that there is a name for this kind of situation. This is a, a, a situation or a market characterized by network externalities where it, it makes sense for everyone else, uh, for you to do what everyone else with which you're economically involved, everyone else in, 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 in your network. So if everyone else is uh, doing their international business in, in dollars, it makes uh, sense for you to do the same. And intuitively, in this kind of, you, you can see why in this kind of situation where it's in no one's individual interest to uh, shift to uh, an alternative, uh, uh, this kind of market or situation will uh, be characterized by high levels of, of persistence. Once a standard, the dollar standard in this case, uh, is established, it tends to persist. Uh, it, it gets locked in. So that's the standard argument. What I now want to suggest is that uh, while it may, that argument may have had some um, validity in the past, it's not likely to be uh, valid in the, uh, immediate, even the immediate future. So uh, the notion that importers, exporters, and, and, and international investors, bond underwriters, um, all will want to use the same unit as other importers, exporters, and, and bond underwriters, holds less weight in a world where everybody carries in their pocket a device called a smartphone that can be used to compare currency values in, in real time. Once upon a time, in, in the not too distant past, uh, if you were doing financial business or, or commercial business internationally, getting a current foreign exchange quotation was not that straightforward. You know, you had to buy a newspaper, go to the bank, pick up the telephone. Now you just have to look at your, uh, your, your smartphone. Um, uh, we live in a world where uh, Currency Converter is one of the 10 most downloaded apps at the Apple App Store. So my argument is that even if the costs of switching and interchangeability, switching from using one national currency uh, for international transactions to another were high once upon a time, this will uh, decreasingly uh, be the case. This, this will no longer be the case in the not very distant future. So once upon a time, people made these ar arguments about the importance of network effects and the dominance of one standard and lack of, of uh, interchangeability for operating systems for, for personal computers. Once upon a time, we all believed that there was only room for one operating system, unless you were a dedicated computer hobbyist with no interest in actually exchanging files with your coworkers, and that standard was called, called Windows, or whatever preceded Windows, who can recall back uh, that far. We have learned over time how to connect different standards. We have built open standards, enhanced 
interchangeability. So now there, there's room in the operating system market for not only for Windows, but for the systems uh, that Apple and Google and Linux uh, have all been able to successfully disseminate. So uh, my <coughs> argument is what is true of operating systems for com personal computers will be true soon for uh, international finance. Once upon a time, there was room for only one true global currency. And for a uh, combination of reasons, good economic reasons and ancient history, that um, one true global currency uh, was the dollar. But now, because uh, switching and interchangeability costs have fallen, there is room for, uh, there will be room for several international currencies. Um, so uh, I, I, I will argue that we're heading toward a world in which several currencies uh, share the international stage. I will argue further that, that this wor world is to be welcomed rather than, than feared. If you, you buy my story that one important contributing factor to the, uh, uh, the global economic and financial crisis through which we've been through is the mis mismatch, the tension between uh, uh, our multipolar world economy and our still peculiarly dominated, uh, dollar dominated international monetary and, and, and financial system, then we will be better off when we have a, a, a better match, closer complementarity between uh, the real economy and, and its monetary system, the challenge being uh, whether we can navigate the transition from here to there. So that's my. Um, uh, my pitch at uh, a, a relatively high level of generality, too high a level of, of generality to be uh, satisfying, no doubt. Several international currencies, which ones? Um, I, I, when I think about this, I typically think on a, a 10 year horizon or something like that. What will the, the international monetary and financial landscape look like in, in 2020? Um, Recent uh, uh, events remind me of, uh, of the importance uh, of cautioning myself and, and everyone else that many unanticipated events can intervene between now and, and 2020. Who would have uh, imagined uh, after all? But it seems to me, given what we know now, it's clear that there will be three uh, international currencies 10 years from now, and their names will be the dollar the euro, and the Chinese uh, renminbi. So I, I, I like to, to pause at this point and, and view expressions in the audience. People are, are, are looking quizzically. Some people are smiling because they have um, doubts about one of these currencies. Uh, they're skeptical that um, one of them will, will be uh, a, a a true uh, global currency 10 years from now that it, it'll be ready for prime time, uh, the point being that different people have doubts about different currencies. Um, I would suggest that the fact that there are at least some doubts about all three of them gives more grounds for thinking that no one will obviously be uh, dominant. But let me spend a few minutes um, re reviewing the, uh, the three alternatives. So I take that long flight from California. I land and almost the, the, the first thing uh, my friends ask me about is not, not, not about the dollar, of course, uh, but, but about the euro. Uh, here as we approach yet another of the endless uh, series of summits in Brussels, uh, there is an awful lot of, of euro uh, um, uh, doom and gloom. Uh, that doom and gloom is not uh, e even, even for someone who uh, believes in the euro, I try as hard as I can to do so. Um, uh, th those doubts are not entirely unfounded. Uh, it's not clear that the crisis countries of uh, peripheral Europe being, now being forced to impose dr uh, draconian spending cuts uh, uh, can recover without reintroducing their own currencies so they can devalue those national currencies and, and, and grow their exports. Um, keeping the, uh, the crisis countries in the euro area would re require massive uh, transfers from uh, Germany, and German voters, uh, it is argued, would rather abandon the euro 
and uh, reintroduce the Deutschmark than uh, agree to this. So uh, you will anticipate, given what I've already said, that I do think that this uh, Euro doom and gloom is overdone, and the um, uh, summary I've just given you entails a number uh, uh, of non sequiturs running from current problems to how they are uh, likely to be uh, resolved. So I'm not by any means uh, ruling out the, uh, the possibility, I'm tempted to say, the, the probability of a sovereign debt default by a country like Greece or Ireland or pick your favorite uh, candidate. <laughs> But while a Greek or an Irish default can't be ruled out, neither can a default by the city of Los Angeles or by Nassau County, Long Island. And um, exactly in the same way, here's where people like to argue with me about this point, but I assert that in exactly the same way that a, a debt default by the city of Los Angeles or Nassau County, Long Island would not uh, spell the end of the dollar area, a default by uh, Greece or Ireland would not spell the end of the euro. Uh, and I, I would be prepared to argue as well that um, uh, a country like uh, Greece uh, attempting to reintroduce its national currency as part of this, uh, it, its post-crisis uh, strategy would only be making its problems infinitely worse. Um, the euro is no bargain for the crisis countries, but when you think about futures, you have to think about possible futures, and the alternative is, is even more dire to contemplate. The one country that could, in principle, exit the euro area without precipitating a massive financial crisis would be Germany. Uh, and I think there are two reasons uh, to believe that that won't happen. One is economic, that uh, the euro has been very good for German exports, and German exports have been key for uh, German economic growth in the last 10 years. Uh, uh, a strong Deutschmark would not have produced the same export growth in the past, and uh, uh, a future Deutschmark would be strong compared to the rump euro. Uh, it's hard to dispute that. More important, in, in, in my view, is actually my reading of German politics. So I, I continue to believe, uh, you may accuse me of wishful thinking, but I continue to believe that um, Germany is committed to the larger European project, that the euro is now intimately bound up with the larger European project. Sixty years of European history tell me that Germany is locked into the European project, and it's effectively locked into the euro in my view. There was a lot of talk in the last couple of years about how Mrs. Merkel is a different kind of German chancellor because she you know, didn't live through World War II. She wasn't educated in, in East Germany in the same way as prior post-war chancellors uh, had been, that she wouldn't value the European project uh, like her predecessors did. She may value it in a somewhat different way, but I think recent events remind us that German leadership German business remain committed to this project. They have the small problem that they have to drag the, the voters, you know, the working class along with them. But I, 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 history, European history suggests to me uh, that they will. So the task uh, now for Europe is to complete its monetary union. Europe has uh, shiny coins and, and beautiful banknotes and a tolerably good central bank, but it doesn't have the other elements of a uh, a working monetary union, and I, I view the, uh, the d difficult discussions that are going on now as number one, trying to uh, add the other uh, elements of a, uh, a working monetary union. And I, I read them as, as Europe reluctantly uh, stumbling toward doing that. Um, the, the father of European integration, Jean Monnet, said Europe is forged in, in crises. European leaders uh, only do something, hopefully the right thing, when their backs uh, are to the wall. So soon again, uh, their, their backs will reside, and, and I think they will um, take steps to uh, strengthen uh, the weak banks. They will rationalize the way bank regulation is done in Europe by giving the European Banking Authority authority, finally, 
um, that will then enable to restructure the debts of, of the crisis countries without bringing down the banking system. There will be uh, very, very limited pooling uh, of fiscal capacity to properly fund the European stability mechanism. Uh, there will be strength and surveillance. A short list of three or four items I've just enumerated. It gets much longer when you unpack it and think what it all involves. But I think European leaders know, Euro area leaders know what is involved and they will move now fairly um, expeditiously, at least by European standards, to complete uh, the process. If anything, I worry more about the, uh, the dollar than I, I, I do uh, about international confidence in, in, in the dollar in some ways than I do about the euro. You in, in, in Europe, um, you know, the UK clearly, but uh, continental Europe as well, are able to have a, a, a discussion over your fiscal problems and sketch out alternatives for dealing with them. We are totally unable in the United States to have a, a, a constructive dialogue about fiscal problems. So um, I, I am not the expert on U.S. fiscal policy that Peter Orszag is, which permits me to say you only need to address two problems in order to fix the uh, gaping medium-term structural budget deficits that we have in the United States. You need to deal with uh, entitlement programs, which means first and foremost uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. And you need to do revenue enhancement because Americans are not allowed to say tax increases. <laughs> we have a few people who are prepared to address one or the other of those items, but it is clear to anyone who ponders the numbers for a few minutes that you will have to operate on both margins in order to solve this problem in the, in the United States. And there's no willingness to discuss that. Those who are willing to open their mouths about entitlements are unwilling to touch uh, the other item and, and vice versa. There's no sign to me that uh, American politics are becoming less polarized in a fashion that would permit a meeting uh, of the minds. Um, so nothing is happening now despite lots of uh, um, chatter. Nothing will happen next year. Uh, because it's a presidential election year and, and all the items that I've described to you will be off the table during the electoral silly season. So uh, I, I think what the markets will be doing is looking to early 2013 after the election is over. Now the grown-ups can resurface and will they be serious about uh, 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 addressing these problems? And if they don't see it, they will grow anxious about uh, uh, the prospects for uh, U.S. sovereign debt, whether the Fed is going to uh, inflate them away. They observe uh, already the Treasury trying fairly desperately to lengthen the term structure of the debt in the U.S. Doing so would make it easier to inflate away at its real value. They see private, you know, the biggest private investors like PIMCO down the coast uh, from me in, in California getting out of the market al already. So there could come a point where uh, a foreign central bank holding a bunch of dollars doesn't want to be the one left holding the bag. And it scrambles out and you get a cascade of central banks and, and other, other investors scrambling out. So in, in the book I tell the story of how the, um, the Bretton Woods system finally collapsed when Richard Nixon closed the, uh, the gold window, suspended the convertibility of the dollar into gold at a, at a fixed price for official foreign holders in 1971. And the precipitating event was, of course, uh, the decision by one, one uh, foreign central bank to convert its uh, dollars into gold before it was too late, that being the Bank of England. So uh, it can, history tells us, you know, this kind of thing can happen. Uh, you can hang together you can hang separately and sometimes the incentive to scramble out you end up hanging separately can be quite strong. So I worry about that when I wrote the book. I said optimistic things like the United States has five years to get its fiscal house in order. The markets will take it that long. Uh, I grow more worried uh, with the passage of time. I get reminded that financial crises almost always occur around the time of elections. 
or, or that's what history seems to uh, suggest. Finally, uh, the Chinese uh, renminbi. Um, China will have to surmount very significant challenges in order to uh, internationalize uh, its currency. It will have to open uh, its financial markets to foreign investors. It will have to finish the process of commercializing its banking system in order to make it safe for capital inflows uh, and outflows. It will have to distance the banks from the state-owned enterprises that they uh, subsidize. It will have to move to a more flexible exchange rate to accommodate the disturbances that come with freer capital inflows and outflows. It will have to establish rule of law in order to convince foreign investors that Shanghai is a safe place to, to park your money. Um, so this is not a process that, that will be completed uh, overnight. I think it will be uh, completed, can be completed in as short a period as 10 years. So I get a lot of pushback from people I talk to, uh, like you, you all, uh, about whether it can really be completed that quickly. And uh, I think it can really for two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, the Chinese have uh, articulated uh, a, a, a strategy for internationalizing the, the renminbi. This is their, one of their priorities now. They've said they want to elevate Shanghai to the status of a true international financial center by 2020. We've underestimated them before, should we underestimate them uh, again? They want to move gradually in the way the Chinese typically do. They understand well that international currency status has different dimensions, and it's safe to develop some before it's safe to develop the others. So they're developing the role of the ren renminbi in trade finance and trade settlements first. They're developing uh, the role of their currency as a currency in which to denominate international bonds uh, second, other kinds of international finance will come third, and the importance of the renminbi as a, a reserve currency will come last. It's the last that people look at when they run horse races between currencies because the data on the currency composition uh, of um, foreign reserves can just be snatched from uh, the IMF website with some, some caveats. The Chinese understand that uh, that's the caboose on the train, and they, they are doing other things. First, So in the last year, we've moved from a position where the um, ren ren renminbi basically wasn't used at all for trade settlements to a point where 70,000 Chinese companies, uh, according to the latest figures I've seen, have been using the ren renminbi in their cross-border settlements, and, and foreign purchasers have willingly been uh, on the other end uh, of that. They're, uh, at latest report are something on the order of uh, 46 international corporations that have issued dim sum bonds, uh, renminbi uh, denominated bonds in Hong Kong and we know that this is the way the Chinese work. They test it out in Hong Kong and if it, it works they bring it on shore. So I think they're going to be doing the same thing for select trustworthy uh, foreign corporations in the not too distant future and if it's safe for McDonald's and Caterpillar to issue in Shanghai. They'll consider letting uh, other, other corporations do um, similarly. So I, I, I think they are moving very fast, and, and we shouldn't uh, underestimate them. The reason they're moving so fast is they think dollar uh, uh, dependence has uh, a variety of disadvantages. Uh, among other things, it's a disadvantage for their own uh, banks and corporations to have to do business in somebody else's money, to uh, pay the costs uh, of foreign exchange transactions, uh, to bear the exchange risk. It makes life, makes it more difficult for Chinese banks to uh, acquire foreign market share. So I can now open a renminbi denominated deposit account in New York through the Bank of China, you know, the commercial bank, not the, the central bank, the people's bank of China. It's FDIC insured. I don't, I don't think you can do this from the UK, but, you know, the miracles of the internet, who knows for sure. There is a cap on it. Those accounts are limited to $4,000, but you can see how it's going to go up over time. And, and this is all part of a strategy of, of reducing their, their dependence on the dollar. Why do I think they can do it in as short a period as 10 years? 
One reason is that's the, the target they've set for themselves. And I think more generally, they are committed to rebalancing their economy away from uh, its old basis toward more, more consumption, more, more exchange rate flexibility, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and that they can successfully do that or make a lot of progress in that direction over the coming decade. The other reason I think it can be done in, in as short a period as 10 years is that 10 years was how long it took the United States to move from a position where the dollar was not used internationally at all, at all, to the position where the dollar was in fact the dominant international currency. So the dollar was not used for trade uh, invoicing or trade settlements at all in 1914 not even by U.S. importers and exporters who, if they wanted trade credit in order to import coffee beans from Brazil, they would uh, go to their local bank, which would send a, a telegram to its London correspondent, and the trade credit would come from London and, and be denominated in, uh, in sterling. The dollar was the currency of denomination for 0% of international bonds floated by third countries prior to 1914. The dollar accounted for 0.0% of foreign exchange reserves worldwide in 1914. And all that uh, had changed by 1924. So what, what I say now is different from what the, uh, the history textbooks say, but it, it reflects the, the research that I've been doing in recent years. By 1924, the, the dollar had surp surpassed sterling already as the leading reserve currency by uh, a small margin. By 1924, the dollar had surpassed sterling as the leading currency in which third countries denominated uh, the bonds they wanted to sell to international investors. By 1924, more trade credit uh, worldwide was sourced in New York and denominated in dollars than was sourced in <coughs> London and denominated in sterling. It can be done in a decade. It was done largely because uh, U.S. policymakers set out to do it for exactly the same reasons that Chinese policymakers now want to internationalize uh, the renminbi. Um, they saw uh, U.S. banks and firms having to do business in other people's money as a competitive disadvantage. So people like Benjamin Strong, uh, um, J.P. Morgan's right-hand man in the 1907 financial crisis, Frank Vanderlip, the financial journalist who became the um, highly successful president of, of National Citibank, Nelson Aldrich, who was the uh, senator from Rockefeller. He was a senator from Rhode Island. He was a Rock, Rockefeller um, relative by marriage. They set out to create an uh, institution to backstop the market in securitized trade credits. They uh, set out to write an act that would permit U.S. banks to branch abroad and originate international financial business. They went to uh, J.P. Morgan's hunting preserve off the coast of Georgia and uh, drafted what became the Federal Reserve Act uh, after uh, a couple of years. So the, the argument is if you provide the relevant institutional supports, if you create the infrastructure that a liquid market needs and, and, and that is consistent with the maintenance uh, of economic and, and financial stability, you can complete this transition in, in a short period of time. I, I know that Chinese policymakers study or have studied this same experience. So to some extent, perhaps they interpret the relevant history in the same way I do. There are people in this audience who will recall that other events intervened, of course, between 1914 and 1924. Um, World War I had a good deal to do with the uh, changing of the guard from, from the dollar to sterling. Every period, however, is from, from that changing of the guard. Every period is special and complicated when you look at it closely. But I do think that, you, that uh, the relevant U.S. history does um, demonstrate that if you make it a policy priority, um, it, it is possible to uh, complete this transition uh, relatively swiftly. So um, clearly, uh, each of the uh, three candidates for uh, international currency status, the euro, the dollar, the renminbi, all have uh, problems. They all face challenges. But I think that's a, a, 
it, itself another reason to think that no one of them will necessarily dominate and that there can be room on, on the international stage uh, for all of them. So if you buy my, uh, my premise that uh, 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 multiple, uh, a global monetary and financial system organized around multiple international currencies is coming, the final question one would want to ask is, should we worry? Um, yes and no, that's always the economist's answer. Um, depends a lot on what you think the problems coming down the road will be. If you think the United States, for example, is a serial bubble blower that, uh, you know, the, the, the next time a financial bubble comes along, it may not be in the housing market, but it will be somewhere else. In a, in a world where there exist alternatives to the dollar for uh, people doing international business and for central banks and governments wanting liquidity insurance, um, the U.S. will feel market discipline uh, earlier and more regularly. You know, um, that bubble will tend to be reined in uh, before it is allowed to get uh, as out of hand uh, as uh, the last one. Um, what the stability of the system hinges on, like the stability really of any system, is the policies of the reserve issuing, reserve currency issuing countries. So it's trite to say the most important thing is sound and stable policies in the US, uh, Euroland and, and China, but, it, but it's also true that that's what the stability of the system will, will hinge on. There is uh, a darker scenario where uh, one of the uh, reserve currency issuing countries screws up and then there can be, you know, flight out of its currency by private and, and official holders uh, alike because there will exist alternatives. So, you know, these sound and stable policies that economists talk about are important. They're always important. They will be um, equally important. Uh, doubly important in, in, in this new uh, system that is coming. What I don't think would be helpful is uh, efforts to uh, stabilize in one way or another uh, the exchange rates between uh, the dollar, the euro, and, and the renminbi. Um, economic conditions will continue to differ between the U.S., Euroland, and, and China. Therefore, appropriate uh, monetary policies will continue to differ. And different monetary policies are not compatible with stable uh, exchange rates. I was therefore um, disturbed, alarmed when last August uh, French President Sarkozy made a widely reported speech to uh, France's foreign ambassadors about the country's agenda when it assumed the chairmanship of the Group of 20 in 2011. And he said, we need a, a new Bretton Woods system. We need stable exchange rates between the dollar the euro and the renminbi. He was, of course, channeling French history where the French have been saying similar things for a long time. Fortunately, he's been backpedaling as fast as possible uh, ever since. So I think uh, the French government and the G20 have heard the objections that different people have made to such a scheme. They now understand that uh, an effort to stabilize exchange rates between the leading reserve currencies would quickly come unraveled and attempting to stabilize them would in the end only have, have tarnished the uh, credibility uh, of the countries uh, in, in involved uh, in that uh, effort. So uh, the French talk and, and the G20 talks about uh, a multipolar monetary and financial world, about creating alternative sources of liquidity, about strengthening the incentives for the reserve currency issuing countries to uh, follow uh, sound and stable policies. Um, I find uh, the evolution of thought that we've seen uh, in the last year um, reassuring. So um, let me conclude on that uh, high note. Um, if you buy my argument, um, then you should see uh, our recent uh, economic, monetary, and financial difficulties in no small part as a, a consequence 
of the imbalance or the tension or the incompatibility between uh, our multipolar world economy and our peculiarly do dollar dominated uh, monetary and, 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 uh, uh, and financial system. Uh, the good news then is that this is a problem that should solve itself if we give it time, uh, time to work. Given 10 years uh, or so, the good news is that there should be a better match between the real economy and its monetary and financial system. The bad news is that economic history tells us that financial crises come along every three years or so. So on that note, <laughs> let me conclude. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barry, for a really stimulating uh, and interesting uh, talk. So I think we have uh, up to half an hour now for uh, questions. Uh, is there a roving mic roving around? Yes, there is. So if you could raise your hands. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got a few questions. I think I might take a few questions together. That's probably you, Barry, just uh, so everybody gets a chance to uh, make a question. Okay, so do you want to start with a question? Yeah. 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 Uh, could you actually say who you are when you uh, ask a question? Sure. Uh, my name is Edward Ironman. I'm a, an analyst at Fitch Ratings here in London. And uh, my question is uh, relating to the current fiscal architecture for the European Union and, and the Eurozone in particular. And is there a need for a single fiscal centralized agency or equivalent of a Euro Treasury bond? Uh, in order to uh, alleviate the stresses on the euro at the moment. And then uh, there's actually a gentleman behind, behind you. Um, Hello. Uh, thank, thanks for your presentation. Um, during your lecture, I don't think you so mentioned... What your, what, can you just announce who you are again? Sorry? Who, are, who are you? Yeah, I, I'm an economist for the South African Bank. Okay. Um, uh, during your lecture, um, I don't think you mentioned a single time the currency of the uh, second or third most important... Uh, economy in the world, so the yen, and uh, I, I would like to know your views on how that ir irrelevant has happened over the years and what lessons there are for, uh, for uh, China. And, uh, a re related question is, in that process of internationalization, uh, is, is it a given that a currency has to appreciate or the, uh, the openness of the capital account goes both ways? One more question, I think, from the gentleman in the blue shirt and glasses here. Thank you. Um, Tony Ugard, I'm a student here at LSE. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the, um, the connection between the rise of the renminbi and the political process in China. So do you think that it is necessary that China reforms itself um, in order to become with the supply of, um, of the leading currency? Or is that the second step? So the renminbi rises and then that will lead to reform in China. Or is there no connection at all? Um, so, uh, to remind you, the, um, the first question was about um, fiscal uh, capacity and, and the pooling of, of, of that fiscal capacity uh, in Europe. So, um, no, I don't think that Europe needs to move to uh, 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 completely in the direction of pooling it, its fiscal capacity um, uh, or toward a, a system of fiscal federalism. Um, how far it needs to go depends on what it does on uh, other margins. So, for example, with a, a, a stronger set of, set of national banking systems, it doesn't, it's not necessary to have such a, a, a large uh, emergency financing mechanism to deal with the banks when um, things go wrong. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, Europe will need an adequately funded uh, ESM, uh, European S uh, Stability Mechanism. But what it does on other fronts in terms of restructuring public debts where they're borderline unsustainable, what it does about restructuring problem banks where they could, could become uh, borderline uh, unst unsustainable will determine how, how big an, an ESM they have to build and therefore how, how much of their national fiscal capacity uh, has to be
pooled. On the other hand, um, uh, I think we know that uh, um, for uh, uh, a set of sovereign bonds denominated in euros um, to be attractive to international investors, the collectivity of euro area countries have to have sufficient uh, fiscal capacity to you know, stay current on those bonds and ensure the maintenance of confidence by international investors in those bonds. So I would draw a distinction between pooling fiscal capacity, uh, about which there is real resistance uh, uh, in the European countries that feel like they're going to be doing most of the pooling, and, and um, collectively having, uh, collectively but separately having adequate fiscal capacity. Um, there's another uh, related uh, issue here, as you know, which is that uh, sovereign bond markets in Europe are far from uh, homogeneous, and the fact that they are um, segmented along national lines makes them less liquid than they would be, and, and therefore less attractive to international investors than they would be uh, otherwise. Could that change? Well, we'll have to see what happens with the e-bonds that are uh, going to be issued in small numbers uh, initially and then could become uh, issued in, in, in larger numbers subsequently. The second question, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I heard, I was able to hear the whole thing. So the second part is um, what was, what might happen to the Chinese uh, renminbi when the capital account, is, when the country liberalizes it, its capital account. The first part was about the Japanese yen. Couldn't quite hear. Well, I'm gonna. I, I will be careful to suppress my normal jokes about uh, about Japan. They're not appropriate. You know, kidding about this is, is far, far from uh, appropriate un, under the circumstances. But you know, the Japanese economy has not grown to a first approximation for 20 years. They're demographically stagnant. So uh, a, a global currency needs a, a sufficiently large platform, um, and Japan doesn't have one. Um, uh, looking forward, uh, so the U.S. And, and the Euro area are the are the two big uh, economies, and, and they will be joined, in, in my view, by China. But um, uh, you're right that the yen uh, peaked uh, as a reserve currency, and I think more broadly as an international currency in the late 1980s. Um, again, the Chinese have studied that experience quite closely. They uh, understand the arguments for how the particular manner in which the uh, Japanese did uh, financial liberalization uh, led to their uh, bubble and their crash, and, and, and they want to avoid that. Uh, and, and they do now seem quite serious uh, bubble fighters, uh, it seems to me, in Beijing. And uh, I'm not going to touch your, your second question, which is the exchange rate forecasting one. Uh, uh, above my pay grade, seriously, economic models are, are not good at short-term exchange rate forecasting, we can all imagine scenarios in, in which the renminbi goes up uh, because of capital inflows, but where it goes down because of capital outflows. And we will see episodes of both, I think, as uh, China uh, liberalizes uh, financially. Um, how is this process of renminbi um, internationalization related to the broader process of, of Chinese uh, reform, uh, the gentleman who asked the question was careful not to specify economic or, or political reform. So I find it easy to uh, answer the question about economic reform, that um, renminbi internationalization is part of a, a larger reform strategy that the Chinese have in mind. They understand that they need to uh, rebalance a, uh, away from exports and uh, um, that in, in order to attract this international banking business uh, that they um, uh, want to acquire, 
uh, that they're going to have to uh, engage in, in phased capital account liberalization. They understand that will require a more flexible exchange rate. They are running as fast as they can, which is slowly, given the large and complex economy they have, uh, to complete this process of economic reform. So um, uh, you will know that there are two interpretations uh, of Chinese economic experience, the experimentalist interpretation where there's something uh, unique and different that the uh, Chinese officials have discovered through a process of trial and error where the endpoint will be different than in a normal social market economy and the convergence view which says they're going to end up uh, where the rest of us are uh, uh, more or less. Uh, I'm uh, a believer in the convergence uh, interpretation. So, uh, I, you know, I think they're reforming as quickly uh, as they are able, and the domestic reforms go together with uh, the renminbi internationalization. They are all part of a package. The issue of what this uh, implies for political reform, I, I will acknowledge that I don't have my mind uh, around that entirely. There will have to be uh, effective checks and balances on arbitrary and opportunistic behavior by the Chinese government that, you know, if it occurred, would antagonize foreign investors before foreign investors were willing to park significant amounts uh, of their portfolios in Shanghai. And the issue of whether checks and balances require uh, full-blown democracy or, I don't know, in the age uh, of Facebook and Twitter can occur through other more limited means. Uh, um, I'm not really sure. Okay, I think I've, I'll go to this side of the hall now. So, Tim, do you want to go first? And then I'll some people behind you afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Tim Loynig, Economic History. Uh, today you told us the dollar is 85% of foreign exchange, but you're predicting it's going to fall and we'll have a multi-currency world. So what do you think that figure will be in five years and ten years? Bernard Casey from Warwick University. I want to pick up something you said at the beginning and something you said at the end. You started off by saying, we've been, when we want to hang ourselves, the rest of the world gives us more rope. Well, of course, if the rest of the world keeps on giving one rope, one can't hang oneself, because hanging requires a shock. But equally, a shock on the rope also pulls over, or potentially pulls over, the person who's paying out the rope. So there are limits, it seems to me, to where we might be going. And then I want to go to where you concluded, which was this sort of multipolar or three-polar world, where there were perhaps three reserve currencies and three units. Now, the point is that in this multipolar world, each of the poles is dealing with one another. If there are substantial swings between the currencies of each of the three poles, what are the implications of that? Because it seems to me one still needs a measure tape of some form to um, judge any one of the three um, elements against. And there seems to be a potential for quite substantial instability in a multipolar or a tripolar world and as much instability is in the unipolar world. Okay, thanks. And one more question from the uh, gentleman of the press in front of me. Yeah, I have two questions. I'm, I'm Olaf Staubach with Handelsblatt Germany's Business Daily. Um, I have two questions. Maybe it's, it's just one, depending on your answer. Um, it's relating to currency wars. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a discussion going on about currency wars. And um, I would be interested in what, what, you, what you think about it. Do, do, we still, do we already have a currency war? Uh, is there, are there any risks? And my second question is related to QE2 and the, the question what it means for, for the external value of the dollar. So um, maybe in reverse, because I think the currency wars and the QE2 uh, question are, are, are the same question in slightly uh, different guise. Uh, the is issue here is, is the global responsibilities uh, of the central bank that, that issues the global currency. Uh, and, and the fact that the, that the Federal Reserve doesn't uh, uh, 
take much account of its global responsibilities in normal times. In highly abnormal times, uh, the countries issuing international currencies admirably extended um, credit lines to uh, foreign central banks and, and governments. They understood their singular responsibility for supporting the liquidity of the markets in uh, abnormal, in, in exceptional times, and exceptional steps were taken. The, the, the problem is that under more normal times like today, the Fed, for example, has a dual mandate where it uh, is supposed to pursue uh, low inflation and, and, and uh, uh, full employment. And the idea that uh, foreign financial stability, the, the stability of the Brazilian financial system, should also be on the Fed's radar screen. It's not there. So uh, the currency war's uh, problem is that the Brazilian finance minister thinks it should be. And, and, and the Fed is not permitted, it, and it doesn't have much incentive to take into account the foreign repercussions uh, of its policies. People like um, the, the Princeton professor, Yan Shin, who spent a lot of time in London, has shown us, has emphasized how s sensitive the uh, global banking system, global financial markets are to changes in the availability of dollar liquidity that may be entirely appropriate for U.S. economic circumstances but are not appropriate for the circumstances of countries like, like Brazil that are booming uh, ahead. So uh, the, the Fed says that's your problem uh, in, in uh, Brazil. You have instruments with which to, uh, to deal with it. Uh, that explains, in, in part, why the global dialogue over and attitudes toward exchange, toward capital controls, have changed over time. That we acknowledge that there are circumstances. The IMF acknowledges, the U.S. government acknowledges, I guess, in private, that there are circumstances under under which utilizing capital controls so that monetary and financial conditions do differ across countries where appropriate uh, is not an entirely bad thing. Um, in, in, in the future, there will be this problem uh, about the policies of the Fed and the European Central Bank and the People's Bank of China. They will all be making policy with uh, local economic conditions primarily in mind. And uh, I, I, I think this is the, the state of the world. What we can do about it is we can increase the, the, the range of instruments uh, that the innocent bystanders can deploy to protect themselves. So study, study of capital controls uh, and the like should continue. And uh, you know, understanding better uh, which ones work and which ones don't under what circumstances uh, is what's needed. I think there can be subtle pressure through the G20 process and through the IMF uh, uh, to encourage the central banks uh, of the uh, that issue, the international currencies, to place a slightly higher weight, place a modestly positive weight on the uh, implications of their actions for the global economic and financial system. Uh, and, and there can be better appreciation of the feedbacks from the rest of the world uh, to those countries. Um, the G20 is working on that, so uh, there's a, a little bit of hope there. Um, in, in my talk, to, to turn briefly to the previous question, um, I observed that the main thing supporting the, uh, the dollar was that the alternatives have problems of, of their own. So it is central to the logic of my argument that there be viable uh, alternatives, that people um, worried about the prospects for the dollar can look in, in the course of the next 10 years to um, uh, the euro and, and and the Chinese renminbi and and that that's my 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 belief is there will be those viable alternatives. I think if you want to look out 20 years, um, two countries with um, reasonably well-regulated banking and financial systems, uh, large platforms for their national currencies and favorable demographics are Brazil and, and India. 20 years from now, I would probably add them to the list as well, but it is uh, central to, to the logic of my argument that, that people worried about the dollar have um, somewhere to turn, and that's why I think uh, the 
um, the, the, the fact that people were predicting the demise of the dollar as an international currency after the Bretton Woods system collapsed and were wrong, uh, that fact is compatible with my conjectures uh, about the future because there were no alternatives to the dollar to speak of back then. There well could be in the future. So Tim asked me for numbers. I thought all, only financial journalists tried to pin you down by, uh, I had a guy earlier this, this afternoon ask me about uh, the dollar crash and I said, well, we need to think about it. But he said, what probability would, would you attach to it? And I said, non-negligible. And he said, 40%. <laughs> so it, it, it's uh, 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 a, a little bit like that. Uh, it all, all depends on, on lots of things on, on the, on, no, I mean, it, it depends first and foremost on, on U.S. policy and how it evolves. You know, in, in the uh, scenario that I, I hope for in my heart of hearts, and as a patriotic American, I do attach the highest probability to when we have our financial backs to the wall, we will do the, the right thing in the end and craft a fisc uh, fiscal compromise. And in that situation where we get our acts uh, together and, and the Chinese do and the Europeans do, I would say the 10 years from now, the 85% uh, of foreign exchange transactions declines to 65% or, or 70%. So the uh, advantages of incumbency uh, don't disappear entirely, but they're diminished. Uh, the dollar accounts for 61% of, of foreign exchange reserves worldwide. I could see how um, 10 years from now, that could be 45% with the remainder split between uh, uh, the euro, the renminbi behind the euro, and, and a variety of subsidiary currencies like the yen and sterling uh, behind those. Question over here. Thank you, Robert Wade. I wondered um, what scope you think there is for um, regional monetary funds and um, if you do think there's scope for growth of regional monetary funds, um, what would be the relationship between bodies like the IMF and the regional ones? What kind of role would the IMF as the apex body play relative to the regional ones? Albra. Thank you. Uh, you made the nice point before that um, uh, there is one uh, country that could leave the Eurozone uh, without a financial crisis, and that would be Germany. Um, I'm actually not quite so sure, uh, looking at the exposure of Germany's uh, public banks to Southern Europe. And so my question to you uh, is, uh, uh, would the scenario of Southern Europe breaking away from the Euro and of um, Germany breaking away fr from the Euro really be so radically different from each other? Um, the second question is about the UK. You didn't speak much about the UK tonight. And um, uh, although the um, sterling as an international reserve currency is um, not entirely gone, but mostly gone, London as a banking place is still um, alive and kicking. And um, so uh, um, is, um, is that a good predictor for what, for, for what would happen to either Europe or the US in the distant future? Uh, or uh, are we going to see something uh, rather different? And of course, what's the kind of advice that you would give to Mervyn King in the present situation? And the last question here. Uh, hello, my name is Magda. I'm a student here at LSE. I, was just, I just have a question quite relevant to the previous one. How do you think stepping down of Axel Weber as a governor of uh, Bundesbank, um, that, that do you think that weakens or strengthens your, your opinion that Euro will be one of the surviving currencies? And how do you think it has, that does it have an, any impact on the probability of, of Germany actually leaving the Euro? Or does it have no impact? Uh, so I never thought that uh, Robert Wade's uh, question about regional funds would be the easy one of this set. Um, it's clear that regional funds are coming. Uh, they're coming first in, in Europe uh, through the uh, European Monetary Fund. Oops, I'm, I meant to say European Stability Mechanism. And you can see from the ESM framework 
how, how it's going to work together with the IMF, not unlike the way in which uh, the rescue funds for Greece and, and uh, Ireland were structured, one-third from the fund, two-thirds from, uh, one, one from the IMF, two-thirds from the, uh, the European uh, Monetary Fund, with the negotiations over conditionality spearheaded by the IMF because it's delicate for neighbors to uh, set down conditions on other neighbors. Um, I, I, I would, you know, I, I, I do think that the same thing will probably, similar things will develop in other parts of, of the world over time. I see no hope for the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization in Asia to be delinked from the IMF. So the big effort last year to do that was to create AMRO, the Asian, what does it stand for? Asian Monetary Review, Macroeconomic, Asian Macroeconomic Asian Review and, and Research and, Organization, and, where the AND, sorry, where the AND is to separate macroeconomics from research. So it's not a, a research organization, it's a macroeconomic and research, where macroeconomic is code for surveillance. Right, so I, I, I think they, they're going to have an either hard, even harder uh, uh, job than, than Europe has had in terms of doing effective surveillance. And once they have the surveillance documents, doing anything uh, about them. So if there's going to ever going to be any, any lending through the Chiang Mai initiative, which there hasn't yet, I think it's going to occur in, in, in conjunction with uh, the fund. The Latins are talking about FLAR their uh, Latin American uh, reserve fund uh, as well, which is small and, and peculiar, but is the seed from which a larger regional fund uh, could grow. These things, are, are I, I, I think, are going to be part of the solution insofar as uh, countries have only one place to go at the moment for uh, international liquidity and, and insurance, and in the future may, may have only three places to go. Uh, Reserve pooling uh, is uh, an alternative to that, and, and uh, I think the arguments for it are, economic arguments for it are, are compelling. Shocks are less than perfectly correlated across neighbors, uh, across regional neighbors. There are other links among these economies that make cooperation possible, but there are also big political obstacles to, uh, to making it happen. Uh, the Asians have been trying now for more than 10 years, and they're still kind of at square two. Um, on, 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 on Germany, I think uh, uh, Albrecht Ritschel's point was uh, on the mark that there would be a variety of other economic and financial problems for Germany itself were there to be this bifurcation between a, uh, a northern European euro and a southern European lira or whatever whatever they would be. I, I, I agree with that. I will um, not touch the one on giving Mervyn King or the British government advice on, on you know, the, the grounds that I've only been here for 24 hours. Ask me tomorrow and I'll hazard uh, strongly held uh, opinions. Um, on uh, Axel Weber and the uh, ECB, um, do I want to touch that one? It seems to me uh, the um, number one that these are, are, are times when you need uh, intellectually flexible, politically adept ECB president, and Mr. Trichet um, has been intellectually flexible and politically uh, adept. The second thing Europe need, the Euro area needs to do is to move beyond uh, the point where these kind of appointments are talked about in terms of nationalities and where the most qualified uh, person is uh, ultimately chosen. So uh, how that all that plays out, we will have to see whether the most qualified person is ultimately chosen. So is that an adequate way of evading your question? Um, okay, I think we've got any time for one last, uh, well, okay, two, two last questions, so uh, could you, could you um, let's try and make them shortish if possible. Thank you. Uh, Shiva Page, a trade economist. Why three, or alternatively, why any global currency? Your uh, 
point about the, the smartphone, and you can see it if you've ever watched a broadcast of a Sotheby's auction, they have five currencies automatically displayed. It implies we don't actually need a global unit of account in the same way we did before, and you are already moving your three up to five. Should we stop thinking about global currencies or think about currencies with various different global roles? Alternatively, why not just one? I mean, the arguments for that in terms of costs of conversion, not of, of knowledge, of costs of knowledge, uh, of risk remain, and we've moved from three to four to two to three to two to one. Why should we give those up? Okay, and a question over, over there. Thank you very much. Uh, student of International Political Economy from the New York Warwick. My question is, uh, uh, during the summer of 2008, after the financial crisis hit the Wall Street, uh, the United States government uh, came with a package of re uh, rescue measures, including to use a public fund to buy out the private funds. Uh, it is a signal of for future regulation, the financial regulation change in the future, and how much it will, 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 will cost for the future financial regulation in the US and in the world. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I um, heard the entirety of the last question. I think it was um, to ask uh, uh, my opinion about the adequacy of financial reform in uh, the United States. Um, uh, uh, reform is still uh, underway, clearly. Um, I think the progress that the United States ha has made is deeply disappointing compared to what we were hoping for uh, uh, a couple of years ago. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. It's um, disappointing, it seems to me, by the standards uh, of the UK, which has gone uh, further, or appears to be going further, I guess we'll learn more after the Vickers report and its reception uh, than we know now, but seems to be going further than the United States. We uh, say in the U.S. it's not possible to do more than tinkering around the margin of the financial system because the banks are, are big and the financial system is so strong, uh, so important for our economy. Uh, so I find it a little bit hard to understand how it is in the UK where the banks are big and the financial system is so important for the economy. It has been possible politically uh, to go further. It's not as if you exactly had a more serious crisis than we did. Ours was darn serious uh, as well. So um, I, I, I hope that the process of financial reform is not over. I think when it comes to the U.S. authorities to actually implement the new Ball Three uh, capital and liquidity standards. We do it in a serious way rather than a, in, in a token way, but I, uh, I'm worried. Um, uh, the other question was, uh, why not uh, just one global currency? I am struck by the fact that we got all the way to this point in our discussion without talking about the IMF special drawing rights, which is kind of uh, the closest thing we have to a proto-global currency. Um, I, I, I think the answer is that uh, except for Euroland, which is sui generis and which illustrates uh, the difficulties uh, of, of building, uh, of constructing a, a regional or a global currency, um, Currencies rest on the fiscal capacity and the political capacity of the issuing entity. That's what the discussion about uh, 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 the process of, of European reform is at some level uh, about uh, as well. Um, the way I, I, I put it in the book is um, uh, no uh, global government means no global central bank, which means no global currency. Who would, who would regulate the issuance of this global currency? Who would decide more had to be issued overnight in uh, a crisis? Would we delegate those formidable powers to Mr. Strauss-Kahn, who is you know, weakly uh, overseen by the governors of the uh, um, International Monetary Fund who actually assemble only twice a year? So um, uh, a, a global currency 
uh, seems to me very far away. Um, it's worth thinking about respectable people like um, Robert Mundell and Richard Cooper at Harvard. Think about it, but um, I, I don't think it's a productive direction for uh, uh, actually trying to pursue policy reform. So I think uh, that's a good, very good note to end the, uh, the session on. So thanks once again uh, to Barry for a fascinating talk and uh, good response. To the